Hi, and welcome back. We've got to talk about knowing your business using the IP landscape. And in this episode, we'll cover how you can know your business using the IP landscape, specifically using a very powerful uh, method to understand your business related to yours and the world's intellectual property. Inventions keep the world spinning. From fire and the wheel to today's high tech, inventions power change. Turn your inventions into reality. Learn how to get your ideas to market. This is Invent Anything with John Cronin. So today we'll cover six topics. The first topic is the history of patent mapping. This is important because that came before the IP landscape. We'll move on in topic number two to talk about how the IP landscape method evolved. And then topic number three, we'll talk about the IP landscape as a useful framework to do many things with. In topic number four, we'll then move to how the IP la landscape works with patent analytics, how to put patents on the landscape to understand where the patents are in your landscape. And then we'll move to topic number five. There's many uses of the IP landscape. We'll just go through a handful of those. Uh, of course, there's many more uses for the IP landscape that we can kind of talk in a future episode. And finally, topic number six, where does this all head? What's the future of the IP landscape? And we'll be fascinated to talk about how that works within artificial intelligence, et cetera. And then we'll wrap up. Uh, every time we do an episode and invent anything, we're always thinking about the audience. And here, I think the audience would be for those who would like to know the history of patent mapping and IP landscape. It might sound esoteric, but almost everybody in the patent field is using some sort of analysis tool today. They'd be fascinated to know how this all evolved in the 1960s and 1970s. Then we also think that probably people that would be interested is those that are really not familiar with the concepts of the IP landscape. So this would be a primer for you. And for those small companies who want to have sort of a professional and highly valuable way of communicating their IP situation and your IP strategy as well, this IP landscape uh, episode is for you. Large companies always use things like patent mapping and IP landscaping, although there's many different, uh, you know, terminology, you know, uses for it. So large companies might want to see the IP landscape from where it was really evolved and what it's useful for today so that they can be on the same page with many others. For those who want to prove the R&D efficiency and improve their invention and improve understanding true white space, the IP landscape is one of the only ways to really understand the true white, white space to invent in for future R&D and products. And finally, for those who ultimately want to improve their IP strategy, there is no better way to improve your IP strategy than having a game board, a common game board to look at called the IP landscape. Well, we're gonna get right into it. And what we're gonna find is that landscapes came from the US companies and in the 60s, and then had to travel to Japan and back again. We wanna learn why. Why did this go from the US to the Japan and back again? And then we're gonna learn how ultimate the landscape has become. Really, it's one of, one of two schools of thought, and we'll talk about that. So topic number one, the history of patent mapping. Uh, my personal story here is when I was at IBM running the uh, patent factory for a number of years, uh, my first view of this word patent mapping came up. I didn't know what it was. There wasn't any examples. So I decided to try to find somewhere in IBM, someone who knew something about patent mapping. And so I found attorneys, some of the attorneys that have been around for 30, 40 years, they had some of these patent maps in their office and they actually showed them to me. It's kind of like a big four foot by 16 foot scroll. And as they unrolled it, it was a picture of an object of a, a disk drive or a computer system. And that picture was you know, drawn by hand and there were lines to each section of the drawing with uh, circles on the end of the lines that described the patents that were overlapping on the product elements and also different colors and different things for different companies. So blue is IBM, for instance. And it was just kind of like a graphical map of mapping patents directly on some picture. And that was called a patent map. And this was really used all through IBM's early uh, careers in understanding patents. And what happened is that IBM got involved in an anti-trust uh, suit with the government and settled with the government. And one of the settlements was that they wouldn't do these kinds of uh, pre pre predatory techniques like patent mapping against competitors. So what happened after that is in the 70s, one of the guys who was running I IBM's intellectual property program, Ed Shipman, he retired. And he then decided to become a consultant and he went to Japan and started to educate all sorts of uh, Japanese companies on the use of this sort of patent map. I actually found two books written in Japanese that I had translated 
uh, where Ed Shipman have basically described how these patent maps could be used. And even today, patent maps are used quite routinely by engineers in Japan to understand their own kind of sector of technology. Uh, but as we started to see in the 70s, or mid 70s and 80s, there appeared to be some automation where some Japanese companies were writing software to essentially kind of automatically update these patent maps. So you get these labels that had essentially relationships to the pictures. And then when you did patent searches, these labels would automatically be updated with patent numbers. So we started first seeing the automation of these patent maps in the mid 70s. By 1990, uh, the world started to change where everybody had computers. Uh, you went from mainframes to laptops and desktops. And so in 1990s, uh, a company called Smart Patents started with a friend of mine, Kevin Rivet, and he he created what was called uh, an instantiation of the patent map, but he called it a, third, a theme scheme. And this was an automatically generated picture of the patents on landscape given a search criteria. And so that worked out quite well. It was a, a graphic that anybody could look at. It was kind of like, a, and we'll show you one example in, in later on, that kind of describes all the different areas of your business space and the number of patents in the business space. Uh, and then what happened is this smart patents company got bought a few times and it ended up at Thompson. So th this company, uh, the startup company sold itself to a larger company to integrate it into a larger uh, patent analytics program. So what goes on with this is that these patent maps and themescapes are really visualizations of the patents in your space. And it really fell short. I, as a consultant, spent two and a half decades now uh, consulting in this area of IP analytics and landscapes. And this always comes up that these, these kind of portrayals of the computer automatically generating a picture of the business, whether we call it a patent map or a, a themescape or whatever you want to call it, it seems as if the data that it provides is just not good enough. It's not as relevant as you want. See, the computer can't take some basic concepts and draw a picture of your business. At most, it can create sort of a hierarchical set of links and uh, graphically to various aspects of a space and show you the number of patents. So it's really two schools of thought that I mentioned earlier. One school is, can we really use automation, even AI and all the rest, to generate a really good visualization of the intellectual property map? I would say no. And I would say most people that are experts would agree with me because the reason why we at IP Capital do the IP landscape, which is a method we've created, is really that it's a picture based upon the business where we facilitate what the business is about and create a picture specific for your business. So two, two schools of thought out, automation completely, or maybe using experienced people helping to draft these pictures and then putting the patents on it. Uh, what goes on next is that innovation starts to be improved now on automation generation and patent visualization. But right now, I would say in the industry, it's relatively stalled. I talked to one of the largest companies in the world yesterday who basically are talking about this whole area of patent analytics on maps and so on. And, and it really has stalled in terms of its innovation. Patent mapping is uh, usually tied to people in the patent space. Uh, they tend to do that work. R&D uh, tend not to do this. Uh, uh, you know, deal guys and business guys uh, tend not to do these uh, patent pictures, patent landscapes, patent maps. It's really somewhere in the R somewhere in the patent teams or even intellectual asset management teams. So we can see this sort of IP landscape setup. The background, the history here, is this deep history back from the fifties and sixties at IBM all the way to today where there's two schools of thought, automation versus having experience and thoughtful people create these maps. One can see that if automation is really failing right now and there's not, not a lot of innovation going on, uh, then this need for having sophisticated, experienced people create these maps to begin with is probably the direction it's gonna take for a while. So that's why we would now move on to topic number two, which is how the IP landscape got evolved, get evolved. First of all, these patent maps I talked about were hand-drawn. It's really a product picture element with patent numbers related to uh, each of the product elements. And these early graphics then turned into sort of spreadsheets of rows and columns of whereby you might have products and columns and technology components and rows, map this and show kind of a, a map. And these graphics went from these sort of tables and things to some sort of graphics <clears throat> so that you can now look at the output on your own PC. 
some companies started to do sort of special visualization. There's all sorts of analysis that can be done. So they'd create specific trend charts by company, by time, et cetera. And then these themescapes, which I talked about, <clears throat> came away to like fully automate the uh, IP picture with a computer where no individuals were involved in creating the picture. And then we, what happens is we get to this sort of relevance question. To get real relevance was, how do you get the business issues of your business on this picture? You see, when the computer draws these things in an automated way, and a person from the business looks at the results, they're asking questions like, well, why is this not on the picture? And why is this not on the picture? And, and what does this tell me about my partners? What does this tell me about what's going on with universities? What does this tell me about this new decision I have to make about should I launch this new product? You see, these static maps drawn by computers don't answer business questions. They had provided just a generalized framework of information. Now, if you turn that around and said, suppose that I was to extract out all these questions from the business and then say, how do I render that in a picture? You have a whole different way of, of analyzing it. And so that's what happens. In order to be more relevant, you need to add some experience and some consultants and things like that to get these frameworks built. By the way, every business has a business model and there's hundreds of business models. There's thousands of hybrids of these business models. So every business model for a company tends to be unique. And therefore, the IP landscape of each business would be unique. And here's another point. The IP landscape of each business is unique. And then what happens is that once you can get the understanding of the business and the market and the product and the technology and the inventions of a company, you can draft a landscape based upon that information. So now the IP landscape, as it's evolving, becomes very specific to your own business and very proprietary. So what I want to do is spend a few minutes showing you some examples of IP landscape. So what we can see here is in our first graphic, uh, which is called Map of Hyperbolic Maps. In this particular chart, this is one of the earlier computer renditions of patents. In other words, you have the word print, and you then search for related connections to print with patents. It would have things like draw and things like that. And the computer would literally take patents with the keyword searches of print and go, go into those patents and look at citations of those patents to see what companies, what patents were citing it. And what happened is you'd start off with a patent and get what's called a hyperbolic tree. Now, I bought this company back in uh, 1999 or 2000 and tried to move this into the industry uh, in a bigger way. But the customers kept saying that these hyperbolic trees were very interesting, but what do you do with this? I mean, do you click on each of these things, each of these boxes? And so hyperbolic maps became a way to look at patents. They still exist today, but unfortunately, there's very little use for it relevant to a business and those questions that I talked about from the business. Here's a picture of a themescape. This is automatically drawn by a computer. You give it some keywords, you give it keywords here, like pool and lighting and things like that. You hit the button and it creates this set of islands. The peak of each of these mountains are labeled with more patents. If it's in the troughs or valleys, there's less patents. And it shows you readily how some of these islands connect together uh, in terms of relationship to each other. So this is a themescape. I would not call this an IP landscape, but at least it gives us some relevance. In our next chart called heat maps, we can now go from these kind of either themescapes or hyperbolic trees to, if I have a set of rows and columns, right? I have product elements versus the product benefits or product elements versus technology components. Whatever kind of relationship I have between rows and columns where I can put numbers in those intersections, which are the patents numbers. And of course, I can click on any one of these, any one of these cells and see the patents. Then I can draw a heat map. What's a heat map? Well, in red, maybe there's lots of patents. And in yellow, there's very few patents. So the heat map might say, oh, well, look, if you're going to invent, don't invent where there's a big red because there's already a lot of patents there. If you're going to invent, why not go in, quote, a white space? But some of these pictures got to be sort of improved because Microsoft Excel and some of these other programs you'd use to look at columns and rows of data got to be really good at just plotting things out. So we have things like this Excel-based graph, you know, which is kind of turning a kind of column and row into a, a circle with subcircles. We have uh, an Excel-based graph, other ones. We can have things by year. We can have things by patent holders. We can have things by pie chart sections. So all of these graphical representations built inside of these software tools can now be used to render information. 
once again, the question here is, what does this information got to do with my business? And you need a lot of plots and graphs to actually try to figure that out. Uh, you even have very special kind of tiling things. Here's one from monography, uh, where you're tiling inventions based upon companies. And the size of the tile its position is based upon the relatively importance of it. We take a look at uh, some of the other types of charts we've seen, like this annotation over time. So some folks have actually plotted things over time and then got on those annotations and physically read patterns and created nuggets that they could link to. So now you can tell some sort of historical evolution of the patterns in a space. So this is a combination of electronic plotting with some human interaction to add some more relevance. It's all about relevance. Now, let me tell you and contrast this with the IP landscape is. So the IP landscape is unique because in some of these examples, it's unique because it's extracted from the business issues of the company. And it could be looking like a product focused picture. It could be product focused parts with process for making each of the product areas. It could be user experience from, you know, seeing it first on the shelf to throwing it away. It could be some sort of org chart type of thing where a product has sub products, et cetera. Uh, if we take a look at some of the more specific examples of a landscape, this is one called the value chain. So we all understand the value chain. You start with materials on the right and, and the, the products going off the right hand side to the, to the retail, to the consumer and recycle and reuse. So that's interesting. Looking at the value chain of your IP footprint. And this is an example of the landscape. We have another example of a landscape where we're looking at an internal and competitive IP map to the landscape. This is actually a business model of something that takes data in a user interface, reports it, has some secret XXX algorithms, and it marks it up, and it shows the difference to the customers and the suppliers, and it has these other sort of processes that are running to extract data. This is an IP landscape. This is a picture of somebody's business. We have another picture of a business where we're showing sort of large-scale manufacturing. And it's not just, you know, showing the, the manufacturing process from left to right. It's showing sort of inputs and outputs to a process going left to right, but now it's mapping it to things like product components and benefits and suppliers. So this becomes a very sophisticated IP landscape. And when you start to take a look at pictures like this, we start to recognize, man, the, this can't be drawn by a computer. A, a person, a group has to put this together and then map the patents to it. So very typical IP landscapes could be like food production. We're actually seeing it go through some sort of process from step A to step B to step C. But notice here that it gets into things like cooking applications and, and, and design ingredients and things like that. Again, this is all based upon what the customer thinks their, their business is about. This is one I like in printing technology. It has sort of a bifurcated value chain, meaning at the center, we have conductive ink, which is used for printing. And it's easy to use for high-speed printing at the top or low-speed printing at the bottom. What was unique to this client, though, was it was not only how this kind of product was developed with conductive ink, but their big business issue was how does a customer uh, come in and try their conductive ink? Because it's so expensive to spend time you know, designing stuff. So they, they had this purchase chain going from top to bottom, try, buy, use, and reorder. So here's a purchase chain intersected with the value chain. Here's another final one for an IP landscape. This is a IP landscape of a, a network. We can see all sorts of things in the cloud, in the network. We can see things on the right-hand side, which are inside of devices. We can see things at the customer level, co consumer experience between the network and the customer devices. And we can see software somewhere. And these interrelationships are all the things that this customer was worried about, things like quality and where the future products are going to come from. So in essence, in just this last five minutes, I showed you a number of views of the IP landscape contrasted to uh, these sort of patent maps and visualizations that are automated. And a word about our friend Tony Buzan, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Tony Buzan actually wrote uh, the book called Mind Mapping. And his thinking was, why not have a framework that sort of starts with something in the center and then linking it to what you think? You know, so in this kind of mind map, he's thinking about himself as an advisor. And then as he thinks about himself as an advisor, he could advise government and business. And if he thinks about the government, he can advise Singapore, Mexico, and China. And he's just drafting this by hand based on the way his mind is thinking. And this idea of mind mapping or called webbing, which is now used through K-12, is a great way for people to outline their thoughts for a book or a poem or some author's amount of work. So basically, when we take a look at these examples of landscape, we'll come right back to this idea that... Um, the, the IP landscape is a set of these pictures drawn by humans based upon business issues, and that can zoom in and zoom out. In other words, you can have a, a first graph, 
and then look uh, in detail as you hyperlink over it and get a more detailed graph. When we started doing these landscapes in 1998, it was really all about that these visualizations that were drawn by computer were not doing you know, anything to the client's needs. They didn't, they didn't know how to get data out of or, or good business insight out of these cross maps or out of these landscapes. So, so we recognized what we needed to do was to get the business issues and then draft the landscape from it. So in 1998, uh, we started our IP landscape process. We trade named it, and now it's in common use by many. But what we call the IP landscape still today, in general, is not what most people would think of an IP landscape. So I hope you appreciate this second topic. And uh, we'll be back talking about uh, topic number three and topic number four, where the IP landscape becomes a game board to answer hundreds of business questions. And we're going to learn how the unique IP landscape framework, coupled with powerful and customized patent analytics, can give your company not a great competitive data, but also give you insight into the future of your product directions. You're listening to Invent Anything with John Cronin. Be sure to visit us at inventanything.net. There's information, articles, and more. And you can leave your thoughts and comments there as well. That's inventanything.net. And now back to John and this episode. So let's move to topic number three, the IP landscape as a useful framework. So given what we just talked about, the different variations of the IP landscape, we can see that basically it's a picture of your business. And so when we talk about a framework, it's really that the IP landscape is something that becomes the game board of your company. So you may have played Monopoly or Risk or Chess or Stratego or whatever the game is. You and your you know, players are all looking at the same game board. So we could look at the IP landscape that way. It's a picture of your business. Everybody in the business agrees that it's your business, but now we can put things on it. We can put the number of patents, the number of patent applications. We can put, we can give you a landscape where we filter it just for your customer or just for your competitors. So there's a lot of different ways we can look at this game board. I did show you Tony Buzan, uh, you know, and I had an interesting story about Tony when I first met him. Uh, he's he's famous, and I thought I would never get to really meet him. And I offered to take him out to dinner, and so we went out to the Auto World Club in in the UK uh, for a wonderful evening, about six or seven hours, talking about the mind mapping versus the landscape. And I think we came down to jointly that these were two very useful frameworks. And he had thought that maybe the hybridization of sort of, of mind mapping with landscape or vice versa might be very interesting. I'm going to talk about that at topic number six, the future of these landscapes, because I think he's absolutely right. Both mind mapping and IP landscape are unique frameworks here uh, for you know visualizations, and they both create sort of ways to represent the way the thinking is of the organization. Uh, the IP landscape as a patent analytics tool, its number one use is to answer business questions. For instance, what's the white space? Or where do I need to worry about competitors? Or where is this disruption forecasted? So the IP landscape is the framework by which we can plot information of patents and other information to answer business questions. The IP landscape should be something that gets all stakeholders of the business on the same page. It's a great way to get the CEO and the board and the R&D all on the same page. Many times when we've drafted these landscapes, it's the first time the company has one picture describing their business. We use this IP landscape to connect to many of the other services uh, that we've talked about in the past and the other pod, co- podcasts, like our master disclosure becomes the framework. The landscape becomes the framework about how to draft a patent. Because if you have a patent invention somewhere in the landscape, you can draw connections to other parts of your landscape in the pattern. We can use the IP landscape as a framework for the IP scan, which is another podcast we've done. In other words, if we're going to extract inventions from a company, why not have a, a landscape to go through each box by box by box to ask them where the inventions are. We could ask to use the same landscape for invention on demand. So if we want to invent, the IP landscape is a great way of going through some of the areas of the landscape, asking questions of where do we want to invent uh, and what do we want to invent. Not only that, any part of the landscape is you can automatically click on it and see all the patents underneath it. And so you have this great visualization tool that's sort of guiding you at a high level so you can zoom in at another level. We actually use the IP landscape almost all the time for developing portfolios. So when one wants to create a patent portfolio, it's not just creating 10 to 20, 30 patents in a particular area. When we do it for a client, we want to create the 10 to 20 inventions, 30 inventions across the landscape. So we have patents that are covering their entire business versus just one area. 
And finally, with an IP landscape, you have such a useful framework to talk about your IP story, which is another episode we've talked about. You see, if you're going to try to convince investors or an acquirer about the power of your IP, setting them up with the landscape to give them the context of your business and how much it covers is very important. And then putting your patents and your and your patent applications and your inventions and your trade secrets and your enable publications on the landscape becomes a great way of communicating. If we move from that topic as a framework, we can go to topic number four, which is patent analytics. There are many, many, many patent analytics capabilities for the landscape. So if you have an IP landscape patent search, it really requires deep expertise. The first thing is you have to figure out the right universe of where you're gonna get these patents to put on the landscape. And then you have to have sub-universes and search strings. And a lot of times you're doing it with classification codes. And then you're organizing all that data in the database. And then you start to read patents or do specific searches. And you're populating each landscape area, area based upon this high level of uh, abstraction from things like uh, the, the overall universe and sub-universes and search strings. So in order to do patent analytics on the landscape, uh, really requires some deep expertise. And there's a lot of detailed work. And some of our folks that have worked on uh, landscape analytics have spent almost two decades getting good at it. So it's not just something you can turn around and do. It requires expertise. One of the things that's interesting is when we say let's plot the patents on landscape, what are we talking about? Is it just numbers of patents in a cell? Like how many patents are there on low-speed printing? Okay. But what if I said, well, we'd like to know what the companies are in high-speed printing so I can plot by company. If we wanted to know how many high-speed printing patents there are by time, I could show a trend chart of by year. If I wanted to show how many uh, patents there are by jurisdiction, in other words, how many in the U.S. versus Canada, et cetera, I could do that as well. So you can see for just one part of the landscape, I can plot many things. Well, each one of those things actually are fields in the patent database. There's a field in the patent database called company. There's a field in the patent database called time. There's a field in the patent database called the country it was filed in. So you could see from a database perspective that I could plot all these landscape areas against any, num any number of fields. You'd be surprised. There are over 100 fields in the patent literature, things like patent numbers, titles, citations, et cetera. Wow, just think about that. So sort of taking all these fields and plotting them on the landscape, and then you can plot cross fields, like one field filtered by another field before you put it on the landscape. We could do things like zooming in and zooming out across the IP landscape. Uh, so that you can be really exact about a specific area. One of the exciting areas of the IP landscape process is for patent analytics is writing macros. What do I mean by writing macros? Well, if you're in Excel, right, and you have all these columns and rows, you can certainly use a pivot table or something to plot. Uh, but you can write a macro in Excel that said, you know, I would like to only look at patents that are, let's say, greater than 15 claims. So you write a macro that basically looks at every single patent in the database and basically looks at how many claims and filters out only those things with 15 claims or greater. So you can use macros to do almost anything. And so what we do is we use macros, we create macros to answer business questions. So if a client is really interested in things like freedom to operate, right, on the landscape, where should they really be worried? You might write a macro that is looking for claim elements based upon the products that they are making. So you can see the combination of patent analytics with the 100 fields, and then adding this sort of ability to write macros on the data allows you to have very powerful, powerful analysis. Analysis can find patents for, for standard trends by time, by company, but they can also find other very unique uh, patterns in the data. We can do cross maps from these uh, landscapes, doing a cross map, cross map of the landscape against itself. We can do things like find the needle in the haystack, what do I mean by that? You can write macros on the data to specifically find any kind of very specific question you have in your business. So if you have a question about, is a particular company as a competitor, uh, do they have inventors that are from your company or from other related companies and have those inventors file patents themselves in some other companies? That's finding a very specific answer. We can write a macro for that. Uh, you can find out a lot of things. You can find things in a analysis about legal issues, like what's the broadest set of claims? So maybe there's 2,000 patents in the landscape, and you want to know what the broadest claim is. You can write a macro for that. 
uh, you can follow inventors. You can say which inventor is working for this company and which company did they work like before. And who knows? Maybe you want a list of inventors that you might want to hire uh, because they have just the right skills. And most of this analysis is just creating ways to look at information based on these hundred fields. And that's one of the places for the future of all this is doing all this kind of analysis and writing macros for all these interesting questions about the business. So the IP landscape coupled with IP analytics, it's a great way to answer business questions. And in our, in our next episode, we'll be covering IP analytics in much more detail. Now, coming up, we'll see how the IP landscapes has many uses from R&D, CEO, marketing, customers, even investors. And as AI changes everything, so AI is going to change the IP landscape. And it's going to be recreated towards the future. So let's get ready for that in the next few topics. You're listening to Invent Anything with John Cronin. Be sure to visit us at inventanything.net. There's information, articles, and more. And you can leave your thoughts and comments there as well. That's inventanything.net. And now back to John and this episode. So in topic number five, we're going to talk about the many uses of the IP landscape. First of all, I decided to look up the word landscape, find out its definition. And it really comes from the Dutch word uh, called landscape, which was a name given to paintings of paintings of countrysides. So really, it's at the, at the end of it, it's an artist's rendering of what they see. That's what a landscape is, an artist's rendering of what they see. So the IP landscape is the artist's rendering of what we see, which is why the business issues are so important. So us smart consultants, for instance, will extract all the business issues so that we can construct a picture of what we saw about the business. Uh, and it's a rendering of your complete business upon where your IP could be and is. The IP landscape is a great tool for things like integrating into R&D and tech and roadmaps, because you're always projecting this product improvement you're going to make, what you think the competitors are going to be doing, et cetera. But drafting an IP landscape around it might give you the ideas of what's going on with your suppliers and your customers and your competitors and universities. It might give you sort of an idea of the future of the product evolution. Uh, so an IP landscape is ideal to hook into research and development and tech roadmaps, et cetera. It is another view. If you take a look at tech roadmaps, it's a set of bubbles over time. What's What would be developed in those bubbles? The IP landscape is much richer because it has to do not only with your technology, but your whole business. We have found very fascinatingly that the, the IP landscape is great for the CEO because once, and, and yes, we've drafted a landscape for some of the largest companies in the world. Of course, you can't have a detailed landscape of everything inside of Microsoft. It might just be a very high level landscape of a particular area of virtual machines or something. Uh, for smaller companies, obviously, the landscape's a little bit easier because they usually have one or two product directions and things like that. But when a CEO gets a hold of a, of a landscape, they can use it for all sorts of things. They can use it for training of new employees. A new employee comes in and they say, this is my business. It can be used for planning and strategy. It can be used with the board. The IP landscape is great for customers and for marketing because we have the ability now to actually show our customers sort of where we fit in the overall landscape. Sometimes we work with clients to essentially develop a landscape for them and a landscape for how they connect to their customer, really getting their customer's landscape in our view. So now you can be very relevant in showing your customers your product and technology direction and also your IP position. One of the great things we use the IP landscape for <clears throat> is um, working with investors. A lot of times investors want to understand the business you know, before they invest. So having a landscape showing all the potential of the business and where the IP fits in the business is very important. Also, it shows them where competitors are and all sorts of other business questions on the landscape. Uh, investors are pretty smart. When they see a landscape, they pretty quickly get what the business is about. Um, the IP landscape is a very powerful tool uh, for things like monetization. So you can take your patents in the context of a landscape to show somebody how your patent is valuable within the context of the business space. Uh, back in the day when we worked at IBM, we developed what was called the IBM Proof Package, which was a way to take the patents of IBM and put them in the context of the business we wanted to license to. But that was very focused on things just like claims. But now these IP landscapes can be much broader, showing you know, how the patent deals with suppliers and customers and business partners, et cetera. Uh, we talked about these cross maps before. The IP landscape can create a sort of cross map for targeted white spaces. This is one of the most useful uh, tools for R&D that we found. If we can have the IP landscape cross with itself, 
And what we can see is areas whereby, since every patent has got multiple landscape categories in it, we can start to see where things are heavily patented and things were lightly patented or not at all patented. And those become great areas for white space for inventing. The landscape is used a lot for business model discussion. What if scenarios? One of the nice things about the IP landscape is you can just add another box to the IP landscape and run the data again, run the analysis again and see what the information looks like. So if you decided to virtually like move your business in a new direction, you create some new boxes on the IP landscape, run the analysis again and take a look. So now we can use this IP landscape dynamically for business models and for changing scenarios for what if. One of the things is that we can use this to kick off freedom to operate. Now, freedom to operate is something we've discussed in previous podcasts, uh, but the IP landscape is a great way to sort of kick, kick off these freedom to operates because we can actually understand from the landscape where you're most concerned about the patents of others and therefore use the landscape as the first view to free and operate and do a more formal free and operate on the specific areas that you're worried about. And finally, the, the IP landscape can be used, uh, and this is kind of an esoteric thing, I think, but this is what we found. The CFO always wants to know why you're spending money on patents and invention. Uh, and then like to have context because they're, they're going to go to the CEO and argue about where the spend is going to be. But if the CFO gets to see the landscape and gets to see the thoughtful plan, Almost always, CFOs will back a thoughtful plan and expense it out. So one of the key tools of our, our use of the IP landscape is to show the CFO why the strategy makes sense. Why do you want to file patents in a certain area? Because there's a white space, for whatever reason. Running a little bit out of time here about all the many uses, and there's so many uses that we could probably spend three more podcasts on just the whole idea of what a landscape could be used for. Um, but what I want to do is talk about the future of the IP landscape. Well, one of the things about the IP landscape, it is a picture of your business, right? So it's in a database. So yes, we can put patents on it, but we can put other things on it. We could map products to it. We could see where products are in the landscape, put the number of products we find in each part of the landscape. That would require looking at the, the sort of product literature, uh, looking at websites and looking at uh, all sorts of areas where products are listed. We could automate it by essentially putting any kind of data on it, like enable publication. So any kind of data that we want to put on top of it, we can, and that's the heavy lifting. But once you get the heavy lifting out of the way, updating is really easy. So some of our clients have asked us to automate the IP landscape for products, for technologies, for technical papers, university papers, uh, et cetera. And so by doing that now, we're overlaying on top of the landscape various views of information, just like the military, right? With a sort of a military strategy with an overlaying information on top of the overall picture. So the landscape becomes the game board of overlaying business information. So we can put patents and trade secrets and enable publications on it. We can put our docketing system on it. Automation, though, leads to this whole idea of AI. And automation in AI means that the landscape in the future could start to be automatically generated. Now, you remember the two points of view I talked about earlier, automation, and it wasn't really relevant, right? And then I'm over here talking about the IP landscape getting all the business issues out using smart consultants. And that really needs to be done to get the IP landscape to actually be much more relevant than just pure automated outputs of a computer. But the next step would be that the AI would actually read your business plan and your AI would extract from your business plan the IP landscape. And I think that's the next thing for the future. It's something that we and IP Capital are actually working on. But AI can not only create your landscape by reading your business plan, but it also can create various business models scenarios. And so there are many books written on business models like the profit zone, et cetera. So you can take all these other models using the AI, read the business plan using AI, produce the landscape, but then have the AI go after morphing your landscape to different business models to show you the difference. And then automatically getting the patents on top of it. So in other words, it could be seeking to find the most open business model. Very, very powerful idea. Also, AI could be used to not only create a landscape, but it can create a landscape around a single patent. So put a single patent up and let the AI create a landscape around it. And it shows the impact of that patent on customers, suppliers, on different technologies, et cetera. We mentioned this idea of the war, you know, like uh, the military complex and using pictures as a way of mapping out scenarios for war planning. Same with the uh, landscape. It becomes a game board for mapping out scenarios. One of the things about the IP landscape is that AI can literally be used to suggest expansions. 
So once you get the landscape in place, the AI would read the landscape you got and, and open up each area of the landscape and suggest expansion areas. There's a great new tool out called Chat GPT, which basically type in a phrase and it'll give you all sorts of surrounding information. But why not type in a phrase of each part of the landscape, let the AI extrapolate around your landscape to give you new visualizations and new places to look around your landscape. The IP landscape is really, we see in the future, going to be automated like a design software where you can interact with it real time and produce patents from it. So you, you could point to an area of the landscape, show where you want a patent, and maybe automatically generate concepts, which then updates the landscape. So we can use the A AI to help us use the landscape in sort of an automated design system. The landscape also could be used to do all sorts of things. It could generate agreements. The landscape could be used to generate NDAs. You're always getting an NDA between you, yourself and a client on some subject matter. Put that subject matter in. Let the AI read that subject matter. Let the AI go to your landscape and make sure that the AI looks at the landscape and extracts out all the things on the landscape that could define the subject matter. So this can be used for vendor contracts and all sorts of deals. So AI interconnected with contracts, interconnected with landscapes, becomes a powerful way to expand these. And then finally, the last one I'll just mention, and there's so many different things that can be done, but just imagine having a real-time virtual assistant that can answer any questions of a user by having the landscape in its database. So in the morning, maybe you're the R&D manager and you read about a particular new technology that just got announced and you get on with the virtual assistant and ask the virtual assistant, you know, uh, assistant, could you look at the landscape and tell me if this new type of battery recycling will impact our business. And the virtual assistant will then look on the landscape to where battery recycling is, find the patents that are battery, ba battery recycling. And it might say, well, this is interesting because there's only two patents on the landscape in battery recycling. So I would suggest we do more effort work to understand that. So you can see that the a virtual assistant could be used as long as that landscape and the analytics behind it are in the system. So in wrapping up, we talked about topic number one, the history of patent mapping. Everything from IBM to Ed Shipman to Japan, back to the US, which led to these themescapes and new IP companies, but they all seem to fall short on, on relevance, this idea that it, it wasn't relevant enough. And so it ended up in topic number one, where we talked about basically two schools of thought. One is automation, and one is using sort of some sort of Uber consulting practice to help you. In the second area, a second topic, we talked about the evolution of the IP landscape, which evolved from certain pictures to patent annotations to visualizations. To them, we got to the point where we're not, not only showing many examples of the IP landscape, but all of those were based upon the business issues of the company. We then moved for topic number three, where we discussed sort of the IP landscape as a useful framework. We talked about it as a game board metaphor. We talked about Tony Buzan and that dinner where his framework is sort of connecting things that connected to things where the landscape is extracting from a business issues. And we talked about how those things should be hybrided to, to hybrid together. We talked about all ways that you could use this for things like invention, an IP scan, invention on demand, et cetera, even using it for monetization to show those entities that might want to uh, somehow take a license or pay for the patents, having a landscape that shows the context of the patents would tell a better story. And topic number four, we talked about the landscape and patent analytics. And this is where the rubber meets the road, right? Now our IP landscape picture has to have patent analytics on it. We talked about all the things that could be done with patent analytics. The fact that the patents have many fields, over 100 fields just in a patent. And then we talked about those can be sort of crossed with each other. We also talked about this whole idea of finding needles and haystacks with macros and things like that. The combination in the end with these great, really relevant landscapes with great patent analytics, with great macro writing, gives you incredible relevance answers to whatever your questions are regarding your patent position in the IP landscape, which then led to the many uses of IP landscape. We had only a few minutes to talk about this, but we talked about how CEOs and R&D guys and boards and investors can use it, and the many, many uh, uses inside the company for this. We even talked about how maybe CFOs could look at it as a way to justify patent expense, et cetera. Uh, there are so many uses to IP landscape uh, that it, it almost we should do another episode on this because every time we do one of these landscapes for a company, they're always surprising us by saying, you know, I'm going to use it for this. One client recently said, you know, I'm going to put it on my website. I was like, why, why would you do that? He says, you know, 
I think if I put it on my website, most of my customers would really understand my business. And I could thumb this down and be less proprietary because I've never seen anything like this. And I think this would tell our customers who we are. That was a surprise to us. Just like a number of years ago, someone says, I'm going to use this in my training program. Anybody new that comes on board, we're going to take them through the IP landscape. So we then finally ended up with the future of the IP landscape. Where does it head? Also, we talked about automation and visualization, these two schools of thought. Do I automate or do I use Uber consultants? The future of IP landscapes is, yes, you combine the Uber consultant as an AI on top of the landscape to make it automated. So we talked about the landscape being automatically generated from business plans. We then talked about the, the automation, looking at the business plans, and then morphing models and scenarios around business models, and then using those morph scenarios to go find the patents to put it back on the updated landscape to then do scenario planning. We talked about the linkage of the IP landscape automated to assist in things like creation of NDAs or contracts, things like that, even getting to the point that the AI can be a virtual assistant. But it's a great, great concept, this IP landscape. We've used it for many years, and it really differentiates itself over patent mapping and all these other kinds of technologies, you know, these automations that really are very useful, but they're not as relevant as something related to your IP landscape. So if you enjoyed this, please subscribe and come join our blog at Event Editing and listen to our new series, Event Is at Work. This is John Cronin from Event Editing.